first thing I like to ask everybody when they come on the show is, what's your first experience with a video game? It was uh, my first time I saw a video game was at a bowling alley. Uh, in high school, I was on, was it high school? I think in high school, I was on the bowling team, and they brought it into the Oakland uh, Bowl, and it was a pong game. And I put in, on, I think it was a quarter, or was it a dime? I don't remember what it was. But it was, uh, I was instantly transfixed, because I was, I was into computer programming at the time. I'd learned how to program in BASIC, and it just totally occurred to me as what I wanted to do. It was instant. So what year was this? Oh, uh, oh gosh, it was 77? 1977 and a Pong game in a, in a, in a, in a pool hall or bowling alley. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, that was, that was it, yeah. Okay, well, how did you get into computer programming? So you were, you're of a generation where, not like my generation, where everyone grew up with computers. Yeah, you didn't was, have uh, that. It was by my 11th grade math class. And there were these geeky guys that were all cluttered around a terminal in the back of the uh, in the back of the class, and I wandered back there, and they were they were hooked up to a teletype that was hooked up to the, the Lawrence Hall of Science, where in a terminal, and would let the high schools log into it, and they were programming in BASIC, and I was just instantly, you know, it, it was it just totally drew me in, and we just started programming in BASIC. I remember buying a book on BASIC programming and the first thing I did was a game. Uh, it was a game about flipping coins. And he fl flipped coins and counted heads or tails. And that, that was really it. That was, that was, uh, it was just uh, a great experience. And I was one of, then became one of these geeky guys who would take my, my, my lunch breaks and my, in my, uh, you know, every time we had off, we would we'd race to the terminals and try to log into it. We had three terminals and maybe 10 kids wanted to use it. And that was our first, uh, was my first experience with the, with a computer program. Oh, well, that was what I made. Then I decided to major in it in college. That was my I picked it as a major. Programming. Yeah, yeah. It was just a very natural fit for me. I'll tell you that my first memory of a video game is actually your version of Missile Command. My dad yeah. was from Brooklyn, and he had gone back home. We lived in Cincinnati. He had gone back home, and when he when he came back from his parents' house, he had this Atari twenty six hundred. And he had uh, Missile Command, he had Space Invaders, and he had a couple others. So two of yours, at least. But How the one old six, you? I was three or four. You were three, yeah, great. I was three or four, so this was 1985 or so. Wow. And th but that was way before the arcade version. You never saw the arcade version, then. No, I had not, I have not seen the I had not seen arcades at that time. Right. So you majored in computer science at school. How did you get to Atari? Oh, uh, I was going to meet a friend of mine, and I went to his I went to his house, and he was late, like he usually was. And I was was hanging around on his in, in his front door it was an apartment building, and I had nothing to do. And you know, at that time there was no cell phone. Well, I don't know how we actually got it. I don't know how we actually made appointments with people. But you know, there was no phone. <laughs> you could have called me. You just had to wait for it, right? Yeah. And I wandered down the. Uh, uh, I wandered down the down the down the. It was right near the school. I walked into the job board, the job center, which is something I've never I ne I'd done once before. I knew what the job center was, but I never walked in there. I was a junior, and I walked in there. Literally, as I'm walking in, they're writing on the wall. They're writing, They're putting up a a a, a, a bulletin or a, a, a postcard that said. We have a job at Atari, uh, Atari, the video game company, designing sound effects for a pinball machine. And I was literally, I, I walked in as they were putting it up, and I took it on, I took the number down, and I went, uh, I went to a pay phone, I went to a pay phone, and I got enough quarters to call the number, and the guy said, yeah, come on in for an interview. That was just very, that was, that was my lucky two minutes of life. So that in, was when you were junior year of college? Junior year of college, yeah. It's okay, 19, so 1970, 1980, maybe. How did you get from programming uh, sound effects for? Well, I was uh, a junior. I was a junior in college at times. So I had a, I got a summer job, programming, making a sound editor for their pinball machines. I they they had a couple of pinball machines, Superman, and so they needed some kind of uh, tools to be able to let the programmers make sound effects. 
Uh, and so I got to know everyone in the following, you know, next year I graduated and I went back to the same guy and Steve Calfee and asked him for a job in the corn up group because that was done by the corn up group and they had uh, no, no available slots. So they sent me upstairs to talk to the, the home consumer group, the, the VCS. And that was my pathway. So I went in there knowing all the people from coin op, which was very rare that the people from coin op did not talk to people in the consumer group. They did not like each other, the two groups. Why? Yeah. Why? Because the coin op guys were the guys, it's like the Apple II at, at, at Apple. It was the guys at the back and the Apple II. And, you know, the coin op was the Apple II. They, were all, they did all the real games. They made up the games. They had unlimited schedules and, you know, these, these, these um, they got to make custom hardware. So they had no respect for the for the VCS, which was, you know, had a very constrained memory and very, you know, the, what we did was copied games at that time. We copied the coin op games. Yeah, so, so you took a coin op game that existed and basically had to reinvent it for weaker hardware. Yeah, yeah. We had to we had to transport we had to port it. So what was the process of taking a game like uh, Missile Command or Space Invaders and putting it into a VCS. Well, I understand because I had the for, the fortuitous experience of working in Corn Up the year before, I knew the guys. I knew yeah. the guys down there. So when I was going to port a game, like when I got to do Missile Command, I went down to actually work with Dave Toyer, who did Missile Command. And he shared with me, you know, the algorithms for, you know, the smart bombs and stuff like that. So without that, without that connection, it would have been very difficult. But because I happened to know the guys in Cornop, I was welcome there. What was your favorite game that you designed while working at Atari? My favorite game? Well, it was Missile Command. That was my favorite game to play. Yeah. But that was not my first game. My first game was uh, a version of Night Driver, which was a, which was a game with you know, driving down a black screen. And I had... I used to go to the Atari game room. I would go there every day where you could go in at lunchtime and play all the Atari games. And I and I, I would go there every single day because I didn't know anybody. And that's just where I would go. And I was looking for a game to do. And I just decided to try to do uh, Night Driver. And at that point, I had I looked on the on the on the transcript. I was the only one that ever went to the game room in Atari. I mean, for, for for two solid months, it was only my name that was that was signed in. Nobody ever went to the game room. Uh, they they actually didn't didn't even know they had a game room, but uh, Night Driver. So I just copied it. I just you know decided to try to copy Night Driver onto the VCS, which was very doable because it's only twelve dots that move. Yeah, on a screen. So it was it was it kind of lent, lent itself well to the VCS. And then when it when it came out, no one in the Atari marketing group had ever seen Night Driver. They were amazed. They said, "Wow, how did you think of this idea?" And it was it's an Atari game. <laughs> wow, we should check it out. Was Space Invaders your next game? No, well, Space Invaders was my next game, but not for the Atari VCS. It was for the Atari 400. And again, it was, a, it, was a, it, was a, it was a port, but I didn't know that they wanted me to copy Space Invaders. I didn't know what it meant to have a license. So they said, do Space Invaders, and I said, okay, I'll do, I'll do my version of Space Invaders. So I kind of changed it around and, you know, I didn't realize the importance of a license. I didn't really think through that, that kids would want to have the same game they had at the arcade. So I didn't try to make it the same. And that was a big mistake. That was, that was a mistake that I really regretted. What was that first version of Space Invaders like? Well, the original coin op game was, was, uh, you, you know, you know the core games, game space. Yes, yes. I mean, your 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 original. Port. My, it was it was modified. Like the characters were different. They, you know, there was a big rocket ship on the left side of the screen. It just it, it, I didn't try to make it the same. And I I thought I would make it. You know, because I was twenty two, I was creative. You know, I would sure. I thought I just you know, I didn't. No one no one told me. And at the very end, I showed up to somebody in marketing, and he said, "Rob, why don't you just copy the, the space Invaders game that the kids like?" And I never thought of that. I said, "Well, we can't do that." Why not? That's that's what we paid a title for, and I just, I, n I never realized that that's what people wanted because no one ever we got no feedback from anyone. I just did the game and I said here's here's the game. Uh, and then I, I felt so bad afterwards, and I realized he's right. So when I made Missile Command was my next game, I decided to make it as good of a copy as I possibly could. That's it. I really tried hard to make it really 
as close as I could possibly make it. Now, they must have liked your work because they kept giving you important games to work on. I just picked them. I just picked whatever game I wanted to make. No one told me to make a game. Oh, really? Yeah, I just said, I'll, I'll do this one. Now I'll do Missile Command. You ask, there's absolutely no, no, no schedule. You didn't, have to, you didn't have to submit a proposal. It was the most creative freedom I ever had in my, my whole career. Now, really what cool. did it, did that change by the time you left to form a magic? Uh, no, no. Atari was locked out because the programmer was the was the sole author of a game, so they really didn't care. They, basically, it's did the game in, the, in six to nine months, and and people liked the game, then then you were fine. You're you're golden. If you didn't come up with the game, then you, you, you they kicked you out. That's basically how it worked. There was no real management. You, you, the whole time that you were there. Whole time I was there, when I left, there was a big scramble to give people royalties and give people credit for their work. But there was no, the only games that were assigned were like E.T. and Pac-Man. I remember that. Those were assigned or those were, you know, that was a big, you know, that, by that time there were royalties and everybody wanted to work on these games. So it was, it was different. When I was there, there was no royalty, no credit for your work. And you were just making a game until, until, until you were done. And then if people at, during lunchtime came over and played your game and you were halfway through, then you knew it was kind of good. If nobody now, plays was, it, go ahead. Was the quest for royalties or recognition for your work part of the reason why you left Atari? After I did Missile Command and I, and I sold so many of them, well, I didn't sell so many of them, but so many sold, uh, they gave me a very, uh, they gave me a bonus of a, a, an Armor Star turkey. I got a little certificate for a turkey. Uh, wow. For a Christmas turkey, and I remember thinking when I opened the envelope for my bonus, I remember thinking, you know, five thousand dollars would have been so would have been they would have owned me for life. You know, I was twenty three years old. I, that would buy sure. me a, that would buy me a car. I, I thought, I remember thinking, how dumb they are to just give me a, 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 a. They just didn't think about it. And then we left, and then we were the second group to leave Atari. And After then the had, Activision group. Yeah, and then the management then got really panicked, and then all of a sudden gave bonuses to people. What was it like forming a magic and how influenced were you by the Activision guys? Well, we were totally, you know, in their footsteps. Uh, I didn't know anything about business. It was, it was, you know, Bill Grubb, the, the head of marketing at Atari started the company and we got some programmers from Atari and some from Mattel. Uh, and I just wanted to, you know, my motivation was just to kick Atari's butt. It was just to really just to make the best possible thing I could and they can't have it. With pure, just pure, you know, just competitive. Same reason why a lot of good products you see in the world are done by someone kind of pissed off and wants to teach the people a lesson. You know, a musician who leaves their recording contract typically makes a really good album. Yeah. You know, so that was that was my that was that was what led the Demon Attack. And Demon Attack was one of the best selling. The magic games if i'm yeah correct. it was good it was it was a good one it, it came out it looked very good uh i worked on i really worked on a lot of time i remember going up to lake tahoe taking a month off and just went up to my my family's house up in the up in the woods and uh doing all the code just on paper just I did a lot of work on paper uh and yeah it just really just was motivated purely by by wanting to teach tari you know a lesson did you have any influences for Demon Attack? Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, Galaxians was the influence. Galaxians was a game. I don't know if you remember it. It was a kind of, of a course. space invaders where they peeled off. Where the characters peeled off. And the idea was to make uh, a game that would have many, many possible opponents. Many, many, many villains. So I changed the color of them and changed the, the until I think there's seven, seven uh, different villains and eight different sets of colors and that gave you 56 combinations and so that for you it felt like there's you know an endless supply of new villains that i haven't seen before and then that, instead of flinking off like in galaxian they actually break apart yeah they break apart some break apart some come, come down at you with different levels of intelligence and speed and there's seven different versions of characters and there are eight different color schemes so that gave you 56 different different possible villains and then that game also appeared on a number of other consoles and with a number of different looks. Were you responsible for all the no, parts? No, I did not, none of that. No, I was, I was, I just did the original. And the, we, and the Magic, we did the Mattel version and the Coleco version, version and all that. But we got sued, Atari got sued 
because it resembled uh, Phoenix. There was a game called Phoenix, and Atari had Atari had cloned Galaxians and, and, and made a game called Phoenix, and then they came after a Magic for that. But it was a ridiculous lawsuit. How did it go? It was. It was. They were just like you know. It was early on. They said, "Well, I remember being de deposed, and they asked me." Is it true, Mr. Fold, that you go to arcade sometimes specifically to get ideas for games? I remember thinking, wow, is that where you guys are? I was pretty desperate. <laughs> yes, yeah, I do that. I do that. Yeah. Other musicians listen to music sometimes, you know. Sure, yeah. absolutely. Right. It was ridiculous, but that was uh yeah, they tried to sue us because we bought, we took with us the know-how of how to make an Atari game, and they considered that proprietary. And they also it wasn't just you guys who sued, they also sued Activision for basically the same everyone. reason. I mean, they sued everyone. That was, yeah, that was their, their, I mean, they were a big company. That's what they tried to do. And they even won a lawsuit against North American Phillips over, uh, uh what, Collision Detect? No, oh. Magnavox won a lawsuit over Collision Detect. That was yeah. a big lawsuit. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, you know, it, that was during the time of, you know, nobody knew what was up. You know, over Casey Munchkin. That's what I was trying to think of. Yeah. With what? With what? Oh, something. Uh, oh, it was Casey Munchkin was out. Uh, was is what oh, I was trying to think earlier. Black Mac Club. Right, right. And then, of course, at Magic, we then you know we grew. We you know we had, we didn't know what we were doing. We were a bunch of young guys with a company that did well in the first game. So now we have a lot of money, and now we start arguing about stuff. You know. <laughs> yeah. So it was the first game out of the door, Atlantis, and then Demon Attack. Uh, Atlantis, Demon Attack, and no Trick Shot. Demon Attack and Riddle of the Sphinx. Were the Riddle of the Sphinx. Three. Yeah, those were our first three. They came out at the same time at CES. And they were, and, you know, we were, we were happy with them. The, the company made a splash. At that time, it was very exciting, you know. It was right in 81, I think. It was 1981. It was right at the beginning of the, the big the Atari craze, you know. How was the culture at Magic different than working at Atari? You know, the, or was it very? the creative culture, we tried to replicate, I tried to replicate the, the, the culture that I knew. So we had, you know, lab benches, you know, you work on your game in a, in a public bench, and for, you know, around other people in a bullpen. And that way other people could walk over to your game whenever they wanted, pick it up and see how it is. And that was a really good way of getting informal feedback from people. So we didn't work in private offices. Uh, that was just at the beginning of, we had developed a, uh, a sprite editor, a, a little a little way for an artist to be able to develop our graphics, and that was our that was the big innovation in the magic that we figured out that we could get an artist to actually create our graphics and didn't have to use graph paper and do it ourselves, and that was why we had uh, images that looked really good and we could try a bunch of colors and that the the, the the art director could sit there all day and just fiddle with colors and try to make something that looked really good without involving the programmer. And that was very helpful. That that was a very simple idea at the time. It sounds very obvious, but at the time it was it was like a big new thing. A very lot complex. Of, it wasn't that complex. No. But it, but it was a big innovation in the game business. And then of course now you know that that was been, that was way way early, but we had never no one had ever tried to use an artist to do their graphics. There was no there was no tools to do that. So we made a tool to do that. And but the culture was pretty much the same. You know, the programmers pretty much were on their own to come up with their own ideas, and they were, you know, they were not managed that tight. And you know, if you're expecting to do a game in about six, nine months, a year, now there was not there was no real pressure to ship. You just were kind of like self pressured. So there was there was a lot of uh, uh, marketing involvement in the games. There was no well, we should do a Demon Attack two. Not that it wouldn't have helped, but there was just no communication between the marketing department and, the, and you know, in terms of development. That was, we're on our own developing whatever we thought was good. Was your next game at a Magic uh, Cosmic Arc? Cosmic Arc was uh, was my first original. I considered it my first original game because Demon Attack was very influenced by Galaxian. But with Cosmic Arc, uh, I wanted to make a two-screen game, meaning two games instead of one. Yeah, two games in one. So you have the spaceship yeah. part, and then you have the part where you're saving. Right, and then and those were, well, the, the the second screen was completely original. The first screen was a little bit derived from a coin op game that I'd seen. I don't remember what it was called. Space app. 
Called call what? Was it called Space, space Zap? Zap? Space Zap. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, you can go left, right, up, down. Yeah, um, so it's his, it's his, I've never seen the arcade version, but the uh, Bally Astrocade port is one of my favorite uh, arcade games. Well, yeah, very primitive, but it works, right? It just works. You know, it's just up, down, left, right. Uh, it's very nerve-wracking. Uh, and then that just needed another game. It just felt like it wasn't enough. So then we had another game. And that, and the other game where you pick up the two guys, that was really uh, my first original play pattern that I kind of made up myself. And it was hard. That was really hard. It was the, I haven't done that much in my career, make up a game. That's a whole different thing. What, I, what, I, what I've done very well is take a play pattern that works and just replicate it on computers. That was, that's just, that's just, to me, that was a secret. You don't have to invent new games. To invent something like, uh, uh, to invent a Pac-Man or to invent like a, uh, Tetris was, to me, a remarkable achievement. That's really, really, you know, that's true. It's a different kind of invention to do that. To be able to do that, it's, it's very different. I don't, I don't do that. None of my games are really invented new play patterns. Except for Cosmic Arc. Well, at Cosmic Arc, I tried, and I tried to go on with, I tried to go on and do that with Fathom, which I, which Fathom was a real struggle. Fathom was really, when I really tried to do that, was make it into a full game to invent a new play pattern, and, it, and I really struggled with it. It took me a long time to, because I didn't really know where I was going. I just didn't have a, I didn't have a model in my head. Uh, and then in retrospect, I, I knew what I, you know, I, I did, the, I made a lot of mistakes. That I look at now and I go, wow, I could have just made a, a lot better by doing this. Well, if you yeah. look back at your games, if you could change anything, what would you change? Oh, which game? Any so, game. Any game. Oh, there's, there's, you know, with, with any, any, any author is, you know, basically by the end, I can't even look at it anymore. And really? it took, sometimes it takes me a decade to look at it again. Because I just said, all I see is all the stuff that, that, that I didn't, I never got to finish or I wanted to do, but never could get right and gave up on. And that's all I see. And then I figure out how to do it. I could have done it this way. And I just, like Night Driver, the first game I did, has a bug in it that sometimes the, the screen rolls if we do a certain thing. And now I now, you know, years later I figured out why and it just makes me sick to play it. Oh my God, I can, you know, there's that bug. I could, could have fixed it in five minutes that I'd known. Uh with with Fathom I had I had the problem of uh, I had a little dolphin and it turned into a seagull, but the dolphin itself should have turned into a seagull when it jumped out of the water. I, I, I didn't I didn't figure that out. And you know the way the, the seagull flies is like joust. It's got the chest control and the dolphin should have the same should have had the same control. So there's a lot of little things. It's like anyone in there's any big project. You look at it later and the author, the author basically just gets sick over the stuff that, that wasn't there. And only cool. he knows or she knows that it should have been there. Every, no one else knows that. Yeah, absolutely not. Because for me, a lot of these games are just really enjoyable. Yeah, like Steven Spielberg can't even look at his movies. I've heard he he can't even look at them again. He just doesn't want to see it again. Okay, so let me ask, let me take it the opposite direction. Um, what's something that you were able to accomplish programming for the 2600 that you're really proud of? Oh, uh, well, I guess the, one of the, the bigger innovations, <laughs> this is really technical, but one of the bigger innovations is like in Missile Command, where you draw, you got to find, you got to figure out the distance between two points. Okay. And the normal way you do that is you got to, you got to, you got to square each number, like x squared and y squared, and then take a square root. That's how you find the distance between two points. Uh, well, you can't do a square root on the 6502. I mean, you can't do that kind of math. And so the way we, the way we, we figured out how to approximate that distance was you take three-eighths of the, of the small number and add the big number to it. And that gives you it within two pixels. And that's like 100 times faster to do a, dis to do a distance calculation that way. And all of a sudden, you can do things like triangulate and figure out how far is it from my ship to the to the explosion, and you need to know how far that is in pixels to figure out how fast to shoot the rocket. So you know, little stuff like that, stuff that has no bearing today at all. Well, you yeah, know, but you invented it for that game. Was it then used in other games? That, yeah, that, this, those pro games, programming right? techniques. Yeah, I used that technique all over the place. I also learned how to use uh, how to make a character move not just one pixel or two pixels of frame, but how to make it move one point. 1.5 pixels a frame or 1.3 pixels a frame and that gave it i gave a i gave the x position a 16-bit value not an 8-bit value i gave it a fractional velocity 
And by doing that, you can make a character move very intricately and make it speed up and slow down and do all kinds of interesting stuff, which made the characters move really well. And suppose it just move one, if you make a character move one pixel per frame, it moves very, very, you know, very predictably. It doesn't slow down, doesn't give you any of the, doesn't squash and stretch, basically, which is what you need to make it look, look, look alive. So that, that stuff was really, at the time, was like a big deal. Yeah. Now you can just do it in flash, just pick them up. <laughs> <laughs> that just works. But, you know, but at that point, it was like, whoa, how would you do that? So you were working at a magic during the time that the market declined and what is referred to now as the crash. Well, we crashed. We had a public offering. We had a pub we were going public. Yes, I was yeah, I was we I was gonna ask you about that. Real in our lives. And there's a documentary specifically. There's a documentary on that. Have you seen all of the games? I have. Oh yeah, well there, that's the whole story. I mean, that's a sad story. But that's that's uh, why we crashed as a company. We couldn't psychologically I mean the management team was devastated. You know, we, it was completely devastating. When you're twenty eight and you think you're gonna be worth, you know, millions of dollars tomorrow. And it doesn't happen. You go, whoa. It's like an evil trick. So the failure of the IPO to get off the ground demoralized the magic oh. as a whole. Oh, it crushed us. Uh, we were we were doing we were doing no work the last four months when we were going public. I mean, we were all we we're doing is looking at houses and you know, you know, we're li- we're we're spending the money. We're living, we're living high. And then there is the New York Times we're going public. And it was just, you know, people got divorced. It was a big deal when a company is full of young people that are all going to get rich, and then it doesn't yeah. happen. I mean, you can't, you can't. We had nothing in our prior lives to kind of prepare ourselves for that experience. The disappointment it was just like we didn't even believe it for two years. I didn't did believe you, it. Did you try and get back to that place where well, we tried, imagine? And, yeah, yeah. I took a while to realize it's not going to happen. Yeah, we you try and you kind of tell yourself, oh, it's okay. But, you know, when, when something, you know, it was just like the beginning of coronavirus. We thought, oh, this is going to be for a week. This is fine. You know? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there you go. Now you're too much to do it. It's like different, you know. But, yes, it was, it was, it was, it crushed us. It crushed a lot of people's, uh, it changed our lives. In, re- in retrospect, it probably would have ruined my life to be handed a check for $5 million at 27. But, you know, at the time, it was kind of weird. What ways did Imagic try and go on after that crushing? Well, I had left the I left the company, but what they did is they 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 uh they tried to get into the to the to the Commodore market. The Commodore was a very different market, obviously, because you could put the, your games out on a floppy disk and copy them, and it was just a whole different. You're into the computer world now. It wasn't it wasn't a solid state cartridge, but they they tried to get into other stuff, and then they the PC Junior was I think out the Commodore sixty four. All the machines were there, but the Atari was was over. Uh, the new Atari machine it just wasn't the same. Yeah, you know, we had a lock because we knew how to make the Atari sing and dance. We had we had four years of practice on it already. Sure, it just it gives you a big advantage. You're big, you know, we had a big technical lead. And okay, so, so so you leave a magic in what year? Like 83, 84? 83, Yeah. What do you do next? So on your resume. Um, you're credited for the for the original concept of Night Trap and Sewer Shark. Well, that was years later. No, what I did next was I went to uh, America Online. I was convinced that online games were, uh, were, were were a big deal. This is 1983. Okay. And of course, you know, I wasn't too late with that with that, with that notion. You know, uh, and I and I met I met the, the the chairman of of AOL, which is a very small company, Quantum Link, on the C64. They had an online service, and, and I wanted to do an online game with them, and we picked a casino. We, we, picked, we did the, the world's first online casino, Rabbit Jack's Casino, and it worked. It was, it was, a, it was fun. It was, we did poker, blackjack, uh, slot machine, and it was called Rabbit Jack's Casino, and you can see demos of it, I guess. I don't know where, maybe on my website, but, but there, in that product, we figured out a lot of online online. Uh, all the stuff for online gaming that was needed like 15 years later. So I still get business now going back and doing patent work on, on cause we did the early, early patent, patent, you know, we created some early ideas about how to, how you deal cards on a server network. 
And I thought, you know, I thought online games were going to be a big deal. And of course, and, they, were, they finally were, but not yeah. 15 years later. So I, I, yeah, I went and did, did an extent of that. And then oh, I got I got into all kinds of stuff before we did Demon, uh, before we did Night Drop. Yeah, for years, I kind of was spinning around doing, you know, when I, when I missed, I, I had an opportunity to do Nintendo games that I passed on, which was, you know, a big mistake. You know, I could have been an early Nintendo developer. You know, it's just who you meet. Yeah, you, know, you know, I had a chance to do it. That's not going to do very well. Video games are over. You know, that's why I went on to online games. I figured video games are over. Now, when you said video games are over, did you mean like just consoles or computer games too? Well, it was the crash. You know, in my view, the, the, the market crashed. The market had spoken. And what the market said was that we don't, we don't, video games are kind of fun. But we kind of explored it to its, to its logical conclusion. And that was kind of it. So there's a new machine called the Nintendo, but the games are basically the same. You know, you go fast, you shoot, you shoot, shoot, you shoot the gun. You, you know, you do, you do the basic things, and kids are already have done all that. Now they're into other stuff. Now they're into the VCR. Remember, the VCR was brand new at the time. It was a big deal that you could like, watch Star Wars. That was huge. Yeah. Right. So that was that. You know, you got to take yourself back to 1984, and you know, for a while, video games kind of went away for for, for a year year or two. And, and that was my that was a pretty big lack of judgment on my part. So I never got into the uh, I never got into developing games for the for the Nintendo or the Sega or any of that. I was I was always looking for the newest you know for new i new ideas for you know online games felt like a new frontier for games. The whole idea of sitting in front of your game and playing a game at home I felt like the games were going to be the same. So you know, how, how how so how did you get to Night Trap and Sewer Shark? Was that through PF Magic or was that before prior? No, I, I knew a guy, uh, Tom Zito, who was who worked for Nolan. I still was in touch with Nolan Bushnell, who, yeah. who had a company called Axlon. Yeah, it. and so Axlon's working on the Project Nemo hardware. At this Nemo, point. and they and they needed they needed actually they were working on rob on these robots, and they brought me in to work on their robot toys called Tech Force and those that didn't turn into anything. But I got really in, I got really close to all the people that worked at, at, at uh, Axelon. And then they had this new secret project called Nemo, which was interactive videotape. And it was, you know, a big deal. We can now do a movie and you can branch in the movie and, you know, can you come help us figure out what games to work on? And, you know, I just got into the whole thing. And you know, we, Jim Riley was a, a great, uh, really visionary director, lived, lived in the house right in front of me, in the back of the house. And Jim and I, uh, started working on this thing called Night Trap and, you know, sucked two years of our life into it. But we so, got it to work. You know? So you were working on it, not on, not after digital pictures took over and programmed no, for no, Sega CV. You're you working on the original project. Yeah, five years before. Yeah, there was, Night Trap was designed, it was designed for streaming tape. It was four, vi four video streams. There was no way to go back ever again. You had to always go forward. So that was why the design of Night Trap is the way it is. It was designed for a system where there was no way to get random access onto the disk. You just had to, you were going moving forward through time. So, you back. so you're playing on a VHS and it has four video tracks on the one, one audio track. tape, on one video whatever, tape. Whatever you want, you can move to another track. So it's similar to uh, a product that did come out, the Viewmaster Interactive Vision, which right. had four audio right. tracks that switched back and forth, but you guys are actually swapping video tracks. Well, you would get to, the way it worked is there was a frame grab. You would grab either every fourth frame or every third frame or every second frame, and that way you could see, you would see 15 frames a second. No, half of that. You would see uh, 30 frames a second, but if when we're doing four tracks, you'd only see like seven frames a second. So that's why the, it's very jerky motion. You don't get to see the full 60 frames a second. You only get to see because they're interleaved. On every other frame is track two, every or every third frame is track three. So it was like a, the deck of cards just shuffled, you know, red, black, green, and you know you only see the red frames. The frames are tagged. You know, that's track one, track two, or track track three. And the machine would actually take it, would grab the frame, and you'd see it for you know a third of a second or whatever. So that was how the that was how the the. The, the Hasbro box works, and then then, then Hasbro jumped the whole thing because it was way too much to, to manufacture, and it worked. You know, it, we're all ready to make it. And then, uh, did you try and get someone else to manufacture it after Hasbro dropped out? You know, when Hasbro puts in you know forty million dollars into something and they they junk it, they don't want to be they don't want to be shown that they're wrong. 
They don't, they don't want anyone else to go make a hit out of it. They'd just rather bury the thing. That's how it works with the big toy company. They, so, they, they had offers, but they, 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 they're not interested. And years later, Tom you know, tried to revive the software and got their permission to, to do something with it. But that's, that, was, that was only with the, with the whole new management team at ASRO. You know, well, everyone had to die first. And then, then, then they said, well, it's just an asset worth something, maybe. How many games were developed? Uh, maybe a dozen. Yeah, there was an interactive. Uh, I did two of them. One was Sewer Shark and one was Night Trap. Night Trap was we did it. Sewer Shark was done with uh, John Dykstra, I think, who did the special effects for Star Wars. Uh, Apogee, I think, was his company. And then we did a rock video, and then we did something with uh, Jane Fonda, an exercise thing, and you know we did whatever we. Yeah, we tried to do, we tried to do collaborate with Hollywood, and that was that was a disaster. There's this whole industry called Sillywood that never happened. Sillywood was Silicon Valley meets Hollywood, and it was really a disaster. It was not. It, it just didn't work very well. You know, we tried to go and talk to all the movie people, and they and they wanted to let us onto the set. But like for five minutes, they, you know, and we needed, we needed, we, we came out, I remember we we're going to do something with Star, with Star Trek, and we go on to the set with like, with like 10 pages of script for them to do, and they said, are you kidding? We're not going to, to devote 10 pages of script to this stupid interactive thing, you know, so there's no, no, no market, no, you know, we're not, we can't, we can't put, you know, Kirk and Spock up in front of, you can't take a week out of their schedule to go do this stupid stuff. So, you know, we were really, we found, we figured out our, our pecking order was that we had no, we were like the lunchbox in Star Wars. Like, we had, they didn't want to put any time into it. But we had a lot of deal making and meeting all the people in Hollywood, and it was interesting. It's but definitely it was, forward thinking because now you do have video game tie ins. So, you were trying to create video oh, yeah, game tie ins. Well, yeah, this is way my back in the 80s. Early. Yeah. My timing has always been way, way, I always say I'm never too late. <laughs> You definitely weren't too late for online games. Uh, well, it's not too late, no. And, and you know, the Hollywood Sillywood business, it's just kind of starting. Right now, Netflix is finally doing a couple. There was a tie-in with uh, one of their shows. Um, you know, have you seen the Netflix interactive stuff? Yeah, so they did Bandersnatch, and they did uh, another one recently. I forget the name of it. Right, it was a tie-in. They did it with the actual show. So there's actually, they got, they got them to actually do scenes. Well, see, that was impossible for the, what was it? It was a it was a sitcom, but they actually did scenes for the interactive version. But when I was doing it, they would never consider doing a take of a, of a scene that was not going to be shown in the original show. It was just too expensive. You know, it requires an hour on the set, and they don't have time to do that. Yeah, you know, but now it's start. Now it's finally starting to, and I'm not sure it's that good. I mean, I don't really love it. I mean, Bandersnatch says, do you want to drink a Coke or a Diet Pepsi? It's like, wow, that guy, that, that's what I get to pick. <laughs> so moving from Axelon, how did you get to PF Magic? Well, so now I'm at Axelon, and we made these, video, we, we made these interactive movies, and that was going to be a big deal. And then, well, then, I got, then I got into a technology called CDI. Okay. CDI, CDI was, the, was the first, uh, it was the first, Disc. It was the first. You know, we could actually do random access. We could actually have a you know go back and and that was and the problem with CDI. It was being brought up by Philips, and they didn't want it to be a gaming machine. So we did all these non-gaming games. You know, I did, I did Third Degree, which was a game show. Like, yeah, you know, it was but that wasn't show. wasn't weren't those published under PF Magic? No, well, yeah, they had our name on it. Yeah, they had our name on it, but it was Philips. I think maybe seven people bought one. Uh Interactive Max Magic was a magic kit. Uh, those are the two that I did, did for CDI. Those are hard. I mean, they took a long time. So, so one new, of my, new hardware, new software, new everything. So one of my questions was: Is what attracted you to the CDI in the first place? Again, it was it was looking for the new experience because I figured it was a, it was a fertile platform. I was kind of like I didn't think because I don't know anything about. It. People, I, obviously. I didn't think that kids wanted to play the same games that, that they grew up with, of course. I never figured out that when a kid is born, he's nine years old. It's all new to him. You know, he's never seen a game where you don't shoot everything. So it, that's fine. There can always be games. You shoot everything and you go, you go drive a race car. And that's that's enough for five years. See, and then when he's 39 like me, he has nostalgia for those games he played when he was nine. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Uh, 
but yeah, so when a tractor, it was, it was, it was you know, that I, that I had the opportunity, I met the people and uh, they were in, there was good money. I, at that time I had 30, 25 people. So I had to feed that. It's a big hungry thing, 25 people. So I had to feed that machine. So I had artists and programmers and I had to find contracts that were bigger. So I needed projects that were bigger. And that was, uh, that was what, 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 what CDI offered me. And they were a very complicated studio. And they, they had no idea what they were doing. I mean, they had all these people in charge. All I mean, I, I, from, from the outside looking in, I totally believe that assessment. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was a mess. Yeah, you know, Phillips was kept wondering why does it takes why does it take too long to develop a game, and I remember them coming to talk to me, and the Dutch people came out and said, "Why does it take too long?" And I'm saying, "How long does it take?" I said, "It takes 18 months." I said, "Why is that too long? Maybe that's how long it takes." And you don't know. I said, "No, it has to be done in less than 18 months because our spreadsheet shows this." And look, here it says on the sheet, "It's 18, it's 14 months." Why does it take 18 months? And they didn't know. Nobody knew. We could, have put video on, we could have put video on the disc, but they always wanted to. So we're trying to cram. Look, we got 10 minutes of video on the disc. Wow. You know. So they were interested in pushing the machine as a non-games machine. as more of an interactive no, no, multimedia no, center. Because it cost a lot of money. and They couldn't compete with Nintendo. They wanted to make it something highbrow, like you, you know, have a glass of wine and you learn about, you know, a great art. And that, was what, that was what CDI was for. Early multimedia. Don't you remember HyperCard? Remember HyperCard? HyperCard? No. HyperCard was the Apple multimedia thing on the Mac. You could click around and you could, you, you, that was where we learned about you know, interface and icons. And you know, there were all these tools for developing HyperCard stacks on your Macintosh. And uh, uh, that was a big innovation. Click, you know, we click and you click on things. That was where we learned all about what an interface was. Early, you know, pre web. Pre-web. The hypercard was 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 CDI. Yeah, see, it came from that era. So at PF Magic, you worked. Uh, PF Magic worked on a device called the Edge 16 modem. Oh man, you go through the whole yeah, it's dragging through my whole bloody history. Uh, is that was that? I heard a rumor that that's why PF Magic was founded to work on this device. Is that correct? Yes. Well, that was we. Uh, John Skull and I became business partners. John had done. He was the guy at Apple who had developed desktop publishing as a, as a thing. So he was a marketer. And we hooked up, and he brought in AT&T. Right. Network, and AT&T loved this idea that, that we could play video games over the phone. Because I was still hooked into the idea that, that you know, we want to do something over the phone, let people connect over the phone. And then we used Sega because we knew uh, just from our, uh, you know, from – you know, Nintendo and Sega, I knew who they were. And Sega was interested in doing something with their with the phone. So we so we pitched AT&T on a piece of hardware that would let two people play, you know, Street Fighter over the phone. Just plug in the game. If you both own the game, you can play it over the phone. And that was what the edge was. And that was uh that was the whole platform. And yeah. we got it to work and it it was it was great. And then AT and T there was a time when AT and T was gonna do a bunch of multimedia stuff. Yeah, they running. even had a 3DO license. 3DO, there you go, right. That that time, and so and so we looked at the 3DO, but we decided again, I was always looking for new new platforms, and this is a new my own new platform. So the Edge was a way that we could develop games and, and, and get into this whole thing of other people developing games, and you can play over the phone, and AT&T loved it because we would encourage people to use the phone. And at the CES show, AT&T demoed the Edge with Sega at their booth. And that was a big moment for us. That was when we got our funding. What games did they demo? We demoed uh, Balls, was our own fighting game. Yeah. The fighting game that we did with just spheres. That was our idea that you could just take spheres and make a character out of it. Uh, yeah, I think Balls and Street Fighter with the EA and maybe Madden Football. I think Madden Football was a game. We could, it is early, early. I mean, for us to get into Matt, the EA and be able to go do a week of programming down at EA in their office to get it to work was uh, the problem with the edge was you needed to modify the actual original game. Okay, so how would you get that modification if you're the consumer? Oh, when you, you just bought the game from you, you, when you bought Minor Football, it would come with compatible with the edge. That was part of the it built the code was built into the game. Okay, 
you know, have a little sticker on it. But, you know, to do that kind of stuff is hard with third parties. You know, they get them to all agree and then they change their game and then, then, then the, your, little, your little app API doesn't work anymore. And, you know, when it was all done, we figured out a way to actually do the edge without modifying the, the code at all. <laughs> that was, you know, that was dumb. Uh, but the edge, the, the whole problem with the edge is, again, it was very expensive. Uh, AT&T wanted to manufacture it themselves. They actually charged more to manufacture it. They charged themselves the more more to manufacture it than it would have cost us to just get it done in China ourselves. And it was, and then then AT and T changed direction because they decided, oh, maybe maybe multimeter is not so cool anymore, and they just you know flushed the whole thing. So how close was it to being reality? There were it ads. Was, it was done. We have we have prototype. I mean, it was it was manufactured. It was a manufacturable unit. We never manufactured any of them. So, so we, it was it was it was ready for the switch to be pulled. Ready for the switch, right? Ready for the switch. So after AT and T backed out, did you try and get anyone else like Sega to come to the rescue? Yeah, you try, but you know it's a fire sale. I mean, it's, we we were not we were not cool enough to get that deal done. I mean, you know, we, now now you're now you're into AT and you know because Sega didn't know enough about the phone, about how the phone works, and you know we trying to get big telecom company to do it, but it's it's always hard to do that. Once a big company passes on something, they again they they're not really eager to help you get it to somebody else so they can prove that they were wrong. You know, just, you know AT&T is just not interested in, in seeing is seeing is seeing another company can take it forward. They, they spent you know twenty million dollars on ten million dollars. That's not a lot for them. They don't want to be embarrassed that well it could have been this great yet. That you, who killed it? You know, they, once you kill something, you want it dead. Makes sense. So you don't want it to come out by Sega, for example, if you're AT&T yeah, and you watch it embarrassed. succeed. You're going to be embarrassed and say, who, who killed this? Who was the idiot that killed this? How did you it? feel about X-Band coming out? What was X-Band? X-Band was a modem that allowed online play on Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo. Oh, I, I don't remember. I don't remember. I, I think I was sick of the whole thing by that point. Okay. I think I, think I turned my back to it. Uh, what did I, I don't know. What, at that point, I was just involved in trying to save our company. PF Magic? Cause had, yeah, because we had this whole company built, designed around this edge, and it, it went away one day. And then we had this staff of people that tried to just salvage, which is always, we figured out, uh, I don't know what we did for a while. Then we tried to do talk, we tried to do a 3DA. We were flailing for a while. And then we finally got on, we finally did Peps. And Peps just kind of saved the company. But it was, yeah, it, it was just whatever, whatever we needed to work. Because again, we had, and we, you know, thirty miles to feed, and here we are with this company that just is no longer going to go forward. And what do we do? How did pets come around? Pets came around because because of because at that during this time, uh, Night Trap, which I had done five years earlier, was being uh, uh, lambasted in the media. Yeah, it came out and it became a big stinker stinker in the media, and everyone thought, oh my god, it's so bad. And you know, I had no financial interest in it at this point because all Tom, it was his thing. Yeah, I just, I was credited as the designer, but you know, I did a bunch of interviews and oh my god, it's so bad! Look, the, the girls are being chased by monsters, and you're trying to stop the, the monsters, and oh my god, you know, the girls are 18, and you know, it, it, I, I thought it was ridiculous. But somehow, it became this this football, this political football that was tossed around in the Senate, and, and the game is bad, and I was very embarrassed. I was just really embarrassed that had that I had done this game that was being kicked down. Captain Kangaroo came on TV and he was saying it was bad. And wow, was, I didn't even know that part. Oh, you didn't know that part? No, I didn't know about Captain Kangaroo. You didn't know about Captain Kangaroo. Well, I knew about Captain Kangaroo as a show. I didn't know oh. that he came on TV and was worst day of my life was my mom called me and said, Wow, I just saw Captain Kangaroo on the news. And he said the game you worked on was a bad game. And I thought, oh my God. That's that was the worst game. Because when you make toys for a living, you don't want Captain Kangaroo to, to rag on you. Of course not. That's awful. It was awful. It you was expect awful. it from Joe Lieberman, but not from Captain Kangaroo. And that that was that was the inspiration to make pets. That was right there. Was okay. I'm gonna make a game so cute that even Captain Kangaroo has to like it. And that was that was the pure motivation. My best stuff. I think many creative people's best stuff came comes out of like anger or, or you know or you're pissed off. And I was pretty pissed off at, you know, I didn't think that game was that bad. And I certainly didn't think it was bad for people to play. It was certainly more 
more more more more benign than any kind of B rated you know B B movie. We we chase monsters around. So I, but we decided to make a game that was just so we had the balls technology, which were these little characters made out of spheres. And we decided and I had thought about the pets for years. I thought about a game where you can make a digital dog. And so a lot of this stuff is just timing. And it was it was really the first game that I ever did that was both innovative and timed well. It came out at a good time. It was right 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 around the Tamaguchi era. Yeah. I don't remember Tamaguchi. I do. So it's basically Tamaguchi on a computer. And you know, we we can make the characters that were we had a proprietary way to make the characters of these spheres so that looked distinct, they couldn't be copied, you know, with patented the 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 display method. And they just worked. You know, the dogs just worked. It was just boom. Dogs catch and became our whole company. You know, just you know, and then then of course we're you know we're we're, we're fighting, and so we just the company got sold at that point. You know, once dogs got established, well, I had been I was tired. I was I was I had been being an entrepreneur now for twenty five years. That was no, not twenty five, fifteen years. I, I was just tired. So you were ready for the company to be sold at that time. I was ready. You know, my partners, we were fighting, and yeah, it just, it just, you know, it just, it, we got a single, we got on base, and you know, I remember thinking, well, you know, that's that's good enough. I mean, the the, the, the investors, the venture capitalists, were, would have liked it to have been a bigger deal. And had we had we had we taken it another year or two forward, we could have gotten to the internet, and you know, dogs is a perfect internet product because it got people connected, and you can build build a community. But by that time, I was I was just tired. I was tired of doing new things and looking at the web as a platform. And I was just, I was just tired. And I just, um, you know, so we sold it. You know, we, we did okay. I mean, it, it carried me for many, many, many years. And uh, it, Ubisoft owns the license to pets now. Is that right? Ubisoft, well, uh, we sold the company to a, to Mindscape, which was sold to uh, Mattel. And the Mattel... Had then Mattel bought like twenty companies, and then they sold Mattel to you. They sold the pets line to Ubisoft. We still, we still, we still on version twelve. I don't know. They're still doing it. Do you see anything from that? Did I? Yeah. I mean, I sold the company. I, 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 yeah. I mean, yes. I mean, I, I was, I was, I owned, I owned a, a good chunk of PF Magic. Oh, do you still, do you still see any residuals from pets? Oh no, no, no. I sold, you know, we sold the IP. Okay. You know that was that was what they bought. That was what they bought. So we, we, I I retained none of the IP, but but I feel you know to me it was lucky just to get on base. You know, to, to make a company that that could actually be sold to me was a big deal. Or it felt like it felt like an accomplishment. I mean it wasn't Google, but I mean what what can you know what can you say? So it was. Uh, and at that point, I had done a lot of stuff on a lot of platforms. And then I was I was just kind of tired. What have you done since? So what I did well so so afterwards I was I retired for like a minute, and then I decided that I I wanted to, I wanted to get married, so I got into online games for the dating for the online dating world. That was what I, that was what I got into. I wanted to do games as a as a as a as a thing that way to meet people. And that was a big deal, but 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 I tried to do a company and, and get it going, and it never really. I, I gave it up after a while, but that was what got me got me uh, where I met my wife, and then I, uh, you know, my life changed. I love, I, I, and then, since then, I've done I've done a bunch of consulting. Uh, less as the years go by, and the projects became less and less interesting, because after a while, and you've been around a lot, all, the only calls you get are like, "Can you help me with this bad project that we're doing? And we're doing a bad project and it's out of control. Can you help me?" That that's what I would get. I would never get good projects. So and they got increasingly bad, and I just kind of stopped, stopped being that interested in it. So and the, the games, the nature of the games changed. So now, I mean, you know, you know the games. I mean, right now it's a, it's very hard to develop games anymore. I mean, it's now it's now it's a, you know, it's a hundred million dollar effort. Sure. It. Yeah, it's not like not like one guy, not like I just have an idea and go try it. Now you have to know exactly what you want when you start. And if you and if you need to know exactly what you want when you start, you can't take any risks at all. You can only do a game that you know is going to work, and they're all versions of the same game, right? You can't say here's a new play pattern. I, I'm convinced there's a million more games out there, but they can't afford to try to figure them out. 
I agree now, with you. I mean, if you could, big companies aren't going to take a hundred million dollar risk. And little companies can't afford it because if they come up with something good, they'll just be copied by the big companies. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, what do you think? Do you still play games? And if so, what do you think of the indie scene? Uh, you know, I like I like the little I like the little games on the on, on my iPhone that that are that are fun. You know, that that are that are they're interesting one screen two screen games. You know. Yeah. I can play with my daughter. I don't really like these big mega quests. I don't. I tried playing. Uh, uh, yeah, what are the what are the lost right now? The game where there's a hundred people and we try to win. You know, we, we, you go with the hundred people into a tournament and try to win. What, what is that? What is that game? I don't know. You're asking the <laughs> wrong person. I'm, I'm more guess, of a retro gamer. Yeah. Well, so yeah, any, any game like that is is not. Uh, is like, I, I get crushed right away in five minutes. I mean, if, if I like had, Fortnite, what's that? Fortnite, like, yeah, Fortnite. Yeah. Fortnite. I mean, I'm just, I'm just like dog meat in Fortnite. I mean, literally, it just all I can do in Fortnite is go hide. If I go hide for a while, then I'm fine. Go yeah. hide under some under some bench, you know. Uh, but the moment I'm out there with you know facing anybody, I get immediately losing. And I think there's a big market. I do think there's a big market for games, uh, for 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 older older guys that can that that don't need to win. The game and 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 want to win in one night. I love a game where I can win it in one night. You know, if I can go rent it at the store and come home and, and, and blow up the Death Star in the same night, like after three hours, I love that game. But they can't. They don't want to make a game like that because it needs it needs to have a hundred hours of play. But I don't need to play for hundred hours. I'd be happy to play play for two or three hours, like a Netflix movie. Like an arcade game. game. What's that? Like an arcade game or a '90s or '80s game. This is. <clears throat> No, designed for the guy. Designed to win it in two hours. Yeah. At home. At home. You know, the same time it takes to watch a movie. How would you make a game that you never lose? That anybody can win and no one ever loses. But, you know, they can make that game at Disneyland, maybe. It's not a really model where you sell that game, where you, where you offer that experience. But, yeah, so, game, so modern games to me are not, are not you know, I, I love playing chess, poker, backgammon, any. I've played games my whole life. I love games. It's, my house is full of games. But video games, uh, they just stop, they stop making new ones. They really have. And it's been a while, I feel like, since there's been something fresh in the gaming industry. Well, because they can't afford to. Because of the nature of the industry, um, the yeah. first games are like haikus. They're like little, short, little, well, well-constructed things. And now it's just, it's like a feature film. So you can't, you can't really do it. What do you think about the aftermarket industry where people are going back and re-releasing old games like Night Trap recently came out for Switch or people are making new games for old systems? I think it's kind of, I mean, I'm really happy with the retro game thing. I, 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 uh, I, sold, the, I sold the game that I never finished uh, and, it, and it was fun. I mean, you know, people complained about it and my view was, I never released that, it. There's a reason would that be Cubicolor? What's that? Would that be Cubicolor? No, that would that well, Cubicolor as well, but but Cubicolor is a better game. Action Ops was a game that I never I never finished, and then I ended up releasing it later. It has retro value, but it's not a great game. If it was a great game, I would have released it, right? Yeah. So, so if they find the old tracks of the Rolling Stones. They're not as good as the tracks that you know because <laughs> you didn't release them, you know. Uh, yeah. But I think it's great that I know Dave Crane is working on some stuff for the twenty six hundred, but I, I just don't really. Uh, I, I'm just not interested. I mean, I know that there's there's a market there, but it's kind of a small market. I like I like going around and talking to people and getting going to the conferences sometimes. Every couple of years, I go to a retro conference. It's fun, but I'm amazed that people are into it. I mean, I'm not amazed actually. It's the child. People love their childhood, so you you know, you connect with your childhood when you play your games, right? Yeah, I, I, I do, and I also I feel like my son can connect to me yeah. when he plays games with retro games that I grew up with with me. And yeah, he, and they're they're manageable for him. How old are yes. you? Oh, he's uh, he's fifteen now, actually. Oh, 15. Well, he's he's ready for he's better than you are. Oh yeah, <laughs> he's way better than me. My daughter's six, and she's just now starting to see games that I made. And they they're good for her hand, little joystick, you know. She, yeah. she can do it. But uh, and the retro game, I'm I'm delighted that there's an interest. I mean, there's a big interest. You know, I think it's really great that I touched that. You know, I made something that touched us so many so many lives. Is yeah. there anything that you want to talk about that you don't usually get to talk about that we haven't covered today? Well, I I do think it's interesting what it means to grow up 
Well, when I grew up, and I think you're a bit younger, but when I grew up, it was with TV. We did a lot of TV when we were little. Yeah. What, what TV means is you got you got a chance to see the experience every day that there's a problem and it works out in 28 minutes. In 28 minutes, you know, it's, it's how long a show takes. And whatever the problem was, Lucy had a problem. You know, Marsha couldn't get a date to the prom. Whatever the issue was, in 28 minutes is how long it takes to get to get the problem resolved. And that 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 did something to us. That that thinking absolutely formed formed us growing up. And kids and kids later, maybe maybe your at your age, you got the experience of when you were little, you played your games. Every time you played, you lost. You never every won. Every time. What's that? Every time. Every time, a hundred percent. And that and your basically philosophy is my philosophy was things always work out, always work out. And your philosophy was I always lose. And I don't know what that, that changed us or, or what, but a lot of kids had that experience, you know. And now basically it's I always lose except if I cheat. Now, 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 they, <laughs> now, they, now they can cheat. Uh, but they don't have the experience of it always working out, which is what I had. And I expect that. I expect in life. Things should work out. They do on TV, you know. Uh, that was my fundamental. I think that's how games changed change the landscape a lot and i don't see it talked about a lot but uh the other thing that's weird about the game business is there is well there are people like you that keep the history but for the most part my daughter cannot play my games there's not a machine around that can run it i mean maybe there is if i get the right thing but if i make a game and it you know especially online games you grow up playing playing uh, uh especially online games yeah that yeah that, you, that version of your game that's the game Robert Jack's Casino, which I made, it does not exist anymore. It's not available anymore. No one can look at it. It's gone. And that's not the case of a Charlie Chaplin movie. You can watch that movie forever, or 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 or, or Beatles album. And that that's as good any day as it was when it came out. But these games that kids grew up with, they played this game every day, and you know, uh, you know these online games, and then it's part of their life, and they, they're completely addicted to it. But what's weird about other addictions is this addiction you can't go back to in five years. It's gone. It's forever gone. And that's weird. I don't know. I mean, that kind of, that's kind of a weird thing. It's not true of a book that you read that you like. Go read it later. You know? So that's, it's, it's a weird medium. And people like you guys, that's why there's a, that's why the people try to preserve it. But they're still, it's still not easy to preserve these game experiences. No, it isn't. I mean, I'm a hardware collector, um, so I don't. I, the online stuff is really difficult, like you said, to preserve. I'm a hardware collector. It's not. It's that, not that, that's, that stuff's failing, and then you get they have new hardware that comes out that can play these old games. And but not. But there's no community anymore. You play these games as part of a community. I mean, to, to go back and let and play and play uh, Grand Theft Auto online in you know, an Xbox, that's not going to exist in five years, right? Right. And that, that experience is forever gone. People write it up and there will be videos of it, but it'll be gone. People will make their own servers, so it'll be people who you know who you game with on those servers. You think likely. so? Well, people do it for original Xbox, for example, and Dreamcast, which their servers are down, and some older PC games where their servers are gone, where they put up private servers. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. so that's going to continue, and how do they afford to do that? They're programmers? Oh, yeah. So people are getting together and sharing their expertise I see. in their areas to create, these, to create these services. So one popular one's called X-Link Kai, and that's how people have revived Xbox and they uh, live the server for the original code? Xbox. They rebuild the server code? Those are questions that I don't know the answers to. Okay. Okay. There's a lot of server code there. There's a lot of technology there. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a, you know, I'm happy with my with my with my participation in the landscape, but they're so far beyond what I what I, kids are so good at these games. It's ridiculous, just how. But, I, but the weird thing about these games is I don't like like uh, uh, you know I don't think it's that hard to become a great video game player as it is to become a great football player. I, I believe it's easier to become a, a, an excellent video game player than. Do you believe that than the, the really skilled uh, basketball player? I agree. I agree with you. I mean, one is they're, they're both skills, but one is a lot more physical. So one takes a lot more of you to do. 
Right. It's like it's like the difference between a musician and a DJ. I think there's a lot yeah. of, there's a lot more good DJs. But a good musician, you can pick up a guitar and make something amazing that you've never heard. That's 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 a talent. That's that's bizarre. It's talented to be a DJ too, but it's easier to become in the top ninety nine percent. I think. I agree with you. So. Uh, You've been yeah. very prophetic in your career of predicting online gaming. Uh, was there any predictions that you have that didn't pan no, out or wrong. that you're waiting I'm, on I'm, stuff? I'm, I'm never correct. <laughs> so I've always guessed wrong. I guessed right on pets. Uh, my, my prediction is I, I think that the games are going are to more move up to be like sports over time. That there's going to be there's going to be actually the, the, the degrees of skill are going to be are going to be uh, higher and higher. You, there's going to be more and more gradations in skill as designers get better. You're going to have there are going to be ways to get much much better at, at a game to be really skillful. You know, I also think that there's going to be re, there's going to be a return to games based on what have more luck in them. Okay. And games based games based on luck. I mean, they're, they're much more popular than games based on skill. There's not a lot of professional chess players, you know, which is a game based on pure skill. Yes. There's a lot more people that play poker because there's a game because anybody can win in, a, in, a, in any given day. So these games don't have any luck right now. In other words, you never end or do you end the session of, of playing a, a game where you say, well, I got lucky there. Seems like you don't or I don't. And not I'm, a long time. What's that? I haven't ended a game with that. Hey, I got really lucky, and I haven't had that experience in a well, while. It's not built, in, it's not built into, the, into the DNA of the game. I mean, you get, you get blown away because you got blown away. I mean, you did something wrong. And that'll do it for this episode of the Retro Gaming Podcast. Join us on our Retro Gaming on Reddit for daily doses of collection posts and discussion, pickups, and more. We'd like to thank Rob Fallup for being our guest and sharing his you know, decades of expertise and experience and you know, hands-on he was there during the invention of the video game market. So thank you to Rob for being on here again. My name is Rob and I'll see you next time.